tell you what, that was intense. The wind has really picked up. I don't know if you can pick it up on the mic or not, but it was starting to get pretty sketchy in those woods. There was a leaning tree that I hadn't noticed when I was setting up the tarp and it, it wasn't leaning over my direction and it was on the other side of the tree it was leaning on. So, you know, 90% chance it would have went down on that side, but even so, if that one had went and encouraged the other to go and then, God knows, um, yeah. Had to get out of there pretty sharpish. But peaceful nice night's sleep. Just a, a fairly decent hike over to Caradale today. I, I think it's about 18 kilometers or something. Um, but I've already walked in five kilometers off it, so I'm not sure whether it's 18 to go or whether I've got less to go, but we'll just crack on and I'll see you in a bit. Seeing one of these up close is quite something. Okay, just stopped off for a little drink of water. It's been quite a pleasant walk through the wind farm, uh, making good progress today. Starting to feel it a bit again in the back um, and knees now, but for the first kind of quarter of the day, it's been okay. So that's quite positive. Um, the pack definitely feels lighter on my back and um, yeah, certainly feeling a hell of a lot better than I did yesterday. So just stopped off on this lovely bit of road work. <laughs> so yeah, we camped kind of about here. It's kind of off map, but we've since walked up yonder to the wind farm. This is about where I took that wind, uh, the video of the wind farm. And I think we're somewhere down about here. Uh, so we've just got this to do down into Caradale. Uh, passed the sign that said it was about 15 kilometers from the wind farm. I don't know, probably about 13 or something from here. I passed a Kintyre Way board that said from the wind farm, it's 15 kilometers down into Caradale. So probably only got about uh, 13 or 12 to go from here, so not bad, not bad at all. off for a drink of water and a little nibble in this nice little bed of woodrush. Some of the um, some of the woodlands here are just so beautiful. There's a real nice mix of stuff on the uh, on the margins, scrubby sort of willow with uh, woodrush and ferns and stuff in underneath it all, and that's kind of laced in between all the commercial forestry. Um, definitely different to, to home in the Scottish borders, that's for sure, and just so much wetter. All the trees are clad with moss. Really quite beautiful. Lots of rhododendron. I'm seeing it everywhere. It just doesn't spread quite so much in the east. Um, it's just not quite as uh, productive, I suppose. Anyway, so feeling much better today. Uh, the knee, you know, still getting a bit of like knee pain and feet pain, but if I stop every five kilometers, it seems to be enough to keep it at bay and I can continue on making really good progress. 
And obviously that's helping the mental game as well because I feel like I have a more positive outlook in terms of like ability to complete the journey and just again taking it in small stages, step by step. Just need to get from here to the horizon, then just need to get from there to the next horizon. And then, you know, in no time at all, I'm looking at the hill that when I cross, I'm down into Caradale. So, you know, I decided that I'm not gonna stop for lunch quite yet. I'm just gonna push on. And so feeling really quite good about, about it. Um, and by the end of today, I'll be halfway there. So, yes. I think, to, I think yesterday, and I don't wanna jinx it, but I think yesterday was just really hard and could be the hardest day um, for a number of reasons. But the pack's getting lighter. Um, the walking's easier today. There's not as much fiddly coastal, squishy, slippy rocks and, um, not squishy rocks obviously, squishy mud and slippy rocks. And uh, I'm just powering down a forest road today, so. Yeah, happy days. We'll get down into Caradale and see if we can get some replenishments in terms of the the snacks that I need to replace. Might get a big bottle of Lucasade and loads of rubbish stuff and just stuff it down me. Interestingly, I wasn't too hungry last night. Whilst I was hungry at the end of day two, I wasn't that hungry last night. So I'm unsure then whether I'm going to, to go and just go to a cafe, fill myself full of rubbish to try and top the calories up or actually whether that was more to do with me just bedding into the trip. I'm not sure yet. So we'll see how we feel when we get into the town. Fair example of global warming here. This tree's producing fruit far too early. I'm gonna go out on a limb and do some tree ID with you. So how do we identify a silver birch and how do we differentiate between silver birch and downy birch? So I'm gonna give you three reasonably simple uh, differentiating factors between the two species that I found helped. Um, now I'm not a scientist, I'm not an expert by any means and I've never core sampled a tree to find out exactly what's what but just over time these three have helped me differentiate between what I think is the two. So the branching is one of them and on a downy birch the branches tend to point up um, at an angle, they're quite perky and tend to reach up more or less towards the sky or at least at an upward angle. Whereas branches on a silver birch tend to droop down and a good uh, point to make there is that the on a silver birch where the Latin name is Betula pendula the, the pendula refers to the pendulous nature of the branches. So they tend to droop a bit like a, a weeping willow in the way that they droop over and sort of swing about in a pendulous fashion. So that's one factor, but you can't rely on just that one alone because both downy birch and silver birch uh, hybridize, which means they, they cross pollinate with each other and create hybrid um, offspring, which are both uh, downy birch and silver birch and so we need another one to help us differentiate between the two and I'd suggest using the bark. The bark um, and again I'm not sure if this is exactly scientific but I found more often than not bark on a downy birch can have a reddish tinge to some of the curls. The, the, the bark peels off especially in springtime when the trees put on um, a bit of growth and it's ready to give off um, some of the excess uh, bark that it's created and um, yeah, it can have like a real reddish hue to it uh, but again that's not really enough because young silver birch can look like that as well so silver birch um, tends to more often than not have a really nice clean white bark um, it can be straighter and less contorted than downy birch um, it's, it's more likely to be used as a productive tree, so that's because of the, the form of it. It's usually straighter um, than of downy birch. But that's not a particularly reliable identifier either, in my opinion. So a third one that may help you, that again is not too complicated, is situational. So both silver birch and downy birch are native to the UK but they tend to grow in different situations. So 
more often than not, you'll find downy birch in a wilder, more natural environment. If you see regenerating um, downy birch on the hillsides, particularly in the highlands and the west coast or really high up, it, it's more likely to be downy birch. Um, and if it's a planted woodland, low-lying, and certainly a productive woodland, then it's more likely to be silver birch. And so if you come across a tree, you're able then to use those three factors, the situational combined with the bark, combined with the branching nature, and it should give you a, a reasonable idea as to what it is. So we've got examples here of two uh, birches. We've got this one here on the left-hand side. We know it's a birch because even from a distance we can see the bark and it's quite clearly birch bark. And the age of this tree allows me to say that when I see the pendulous nature of these branches, that it's more than likely a silver birch. There are some branches that are perky and pointing up, but that might just be because of competition with the trees to the right hand side of it. It's fighting for light, so it goes up to find the light. But I would say it's more than likely that that's a silver birch. Now it is situationally in a planted woodland environment. So I'm going to assume that that tree was planted when the Forestry Commission um, took over this place and, and planted it up. So that again is like, that's three ticks for me. It's reasonably straight in form. It's got pendulous branches and situationally it's more like a silver birch. This one here, it's a bit harder to say because situationally I'd have said it's a silver birch. Bark wise, I'd have said it's a silver birch because of the straightness and the, the white color of the bark. But then the branching is all perky. So I can't say with full confidence then that's a silver birch. I might say that it's a particularly straight um, downy birch. I might say the cop out and say it's just a hybrid. Um, and that's the thing, this is all just likelihoods and it's never really certain unless you actually core into a tree and analyze the, the genetic makeup of it. But the three differentiating factors of situational bark and uh, branching structure is good enough for a basic differentiation between silver birch and downy birch. This to me is a good example of what I reckon is a downy birch. So situationally we're still in that planted woodland but this is planted, <coughs> well this is growing right on the edge of that drain there. Right on the edge of it. So <coughs> I don't think a planter would have planted right on the edge of a drain like that. I think this grew naturally and so that gives me the tip for um, being a downy birch in, in this situation. The bark does have reddish colours and tinges to it, but again, young silver birch can look like that as well. But that's leaning me a bit towards downy. And then if you look at the branching, like all of it's pretty perky. Um, but again, it's, it's young and, and maybe isn't of the age yet, but I would say it's more likely than it's not to be a downy birch. So what's birch any good for? We can use it for carving. It's quite a nice carving wood, very easy to carve. It doesn't make the most beautiful utensils or pieces, but it's a very easy wood to carve, so good for beginners. We can use it for firewood. It's, it's all right at that. It's not like a particularly hard hardwood, but um, certainly good for getting a fire going. And um, the bark, which I was just collecting some off there to replenish my stocks, which I used a fair bit off the other night, um, it has um, a betulin content in it, which again comes back to the Latin name, Betula pendula, or Betula pubescens, which is downy birch. The betula refers to the betulin that's contained within um, the tree. So we can use those bits of bark as natural fire lighters. They take a, a spark if you if you take a bit of birch bark, not just a curl off the, off the tree, but an actual card of birch bark, you can scrape it up and that'll take a spark from a ferro rod. Or if you have some curls and you've got a lighter on you, you can just bundle up a ball of those, put a lighter to it and they'll light readily. So, and then they burn for a surprising amount of time as well. 
so that's quite useful. Uh, you get some people using birch for woodworking and stuff as well. You get some birch panels, birch panels, birch cupboards, um, birch sap's an interesting one. I've tapped birch for sap before um, with the idea of making some syrup out of it, but I believe the sugar content in birch is 5%, whereas in like the, um, the, the maple variety that um, maple syrup is made from has something like a 20% sugar content. So you need a huge amount more um, volume to work through and burn down or boil down um, with birch to get the same kind of returns. But it is quite tasty, it's supposed to be quite good for you. I've also roasted birch twigs and um, brewed them in a tea, which is also supposed to be very good for you. Um, although it's got quite a strong taste, I must say. The birch sap water didn't have a strong taste. It's quite refreshing, but the birch twig tea was, was quite a, a strong taste. <laughs> Here's another example where we've got a birch. Now this one has very red bark down at the bottom. It's reasonably straight and no um, pendulous branching. The straightness I would attribute to the fact that it's got so many trees around it and a lot of the trees around it are going for straight as well because they're being forced up with all the competition. So I'm not, I'm not saying that that is suggestive of it being silver birch. And also the situational one's a big factor here because we've got uh, what looks to me to be native woodland remnants within the uh, planted forest and what makes me think that is that the density that all these trees are growing at is way higher than what you would plant in a planting scheme. The ground is very natural, there's a lot of vegetation on it and it doesn't look to me like there's been um, any mechanical ground prep in here. It's all very natural and you've got a few stumps kicking around as well so I wonder whether they've felled some conifers here and this is the regenerating native woodland that's come back and um, there's also a corkin birch just down there um, again very straight but very red bark and no pendulous branches so I think we're into the more kind of downy birch native realms and plenty of bark to be had So if you were going to take a card of birch bark, firstly I'd suggest not doing it on a living tree and do it on a, a tree that's lying over um, or dead standing. Dead standing's better because it'll be drier. And um, you don't want to wait until the tree's gotten too rotten. You want to, the, the best cards come from trees that have died reasonably recently, I find. And you just mark down through the bark layer to the cambium and you just want to um, carve down with your knife, carve along, make a square and then stick the back end of your knife under it and just peel away and work at it until you can peel the whole thing off and you've got a card then that you can scrape the surface off uh, into fluffing up the, the bark surface and that's what, when you put a spark on it, will ignite into, um, into flame. And people wonder why we don't use payphones anymore. I've been in at Caradale and stopped and bought a massive bottle of Lucozade and other such calorific treats but I'm looking for a place to stay now and I was considering this um, Sitka plantation but uh, to be honest with you I think that there's too many leaning trees could be a bit of a hazard I don't know what the wind's going to do tonight so I'm off on the hunt for something better I did pass through some nice kind of amenity woodlands on the way up um, but it's just that thing of I'd rather be far away from dog walkers if I can help it. Um, so we shall keep searching. I'm finding it surprisingly difficult to find a good bit to stay. Every time I find somewhere, it just seems that there's something that throws me off it. I haven't said that. Potentially. If I set up 
against that tree. Oh no. Oh, yeah, that feels right. Slight slant on it, but burgers can't be choosers. I'm, I've, I've tried several other bits. Is there anything dangerous around? I mean, there's blowing trees all over the place, but not in this vicinity. This is the one. This is the one. I've created a monster. This is definitely not a top configuration I've ever seen done. And for good reason, because it's bloody hideous. Uh, but there's plenty of space inside. Um, yeah, I was going for like a diamond configuration, but yeah, it didn't quite work out to plan. I'm going to have to have a look at the books when I get home again and see just exactly how it's done. I've had to fashion this um, adjustable guy line onto there because I don't want water cooling at the base. Um, but yeah, just madness. Back on the chili con cardboard for dinner. See what that's like. Put a bit more water in this time, so yeah, hopefully that sorted that. I'm a bit, a bit miffed about this tarp. I mean, it's quite clearly, you know, there's moisture all over the inside. And these droplets get to a size and are then pinged down on top of me by water hitting the outside of the tarp. At first I wondered, is it just condensation on the inside then forming? Or is it just that the tarp was wet when I put it in the bag and, and it's still wet? But this morning, you know, with the, <coughs> with the heavy rain and how wet everything was under the tarp, after eight hours or whatever of um, being under there, there's just no way that that's just um, the tarp being wet. So that's discounted. And also condensation, like that kind of tarp setup where it's way above me at like, you know, shoulder height or something like that. There's just no way that that much moisture is building up under the tarp. So it must be that the tarp's just leaking. The morning of day five. Good night's sleep again. Uh, another wet tarp, uh, wet sleeping bag waking up. So yeah, this is what it is. Um, another conundrum to continue the theme of constant conundrums on the strip is I appear to be running out of gas. Um, so it's a bit of a problem, but not catastrophic because, well, I use I use the stove to boil my water in the morning to make, um, well, to purify water for my breakfast. Um, and it's kind of essential that I have water in my breakfast because I've got powdered milk in it. So it would be awful to eat with powdered milk and no water in it. So um, that's that's a bit of an issue. But then for dinner, I, I do the same thing in a way. I purify water and pour it into freeze dried food and it rehydrates it. So I need purified water on both occasions. And in the evening, I can get away with having a fire. So that can be a way that I um, prepare water for the evening and save on gas. But in the morning, I'm a bit stumped as to what I'm gonna do because I just don't have enough time to, unless I get up really early, I just don't have enough time to start a fire in the morning just to get the water boiled to get my breakfast on but that might end up uh, being what I have to do. <clears throat> I'm hoping it's going to get me to Campbelltown so a couple more days and um, then perhaps in Campbelltown I find a place uh, that sells gas canisters and that'll get me through the last couple of days. So yeah just going to try and maximise on the fire usage until then to make it last and, and hopefully that works. So um, it's been a bit rainy, uh, winds haven't been so much of an issue this morning which is great so a bit more leisurely start, um, not running out of the woods in a panic. So I'll just get all this packed away, get down off the hill and um, hit the road again. That's a cracking place to camp that. 
So a consideration for this area here at high tide um, it's either this bit or a bit further on becomes impassable so back in the town uh, just as you're exiting on the western side of the town there's a helpful little notice board and people have written on it when the tide times are so for today the high tide time was 11 something so that's fine because it's it's only like half eight or something just now but on Monday and Tuesday of this week the high tide time was um, between eight and nine so you know I would have been stumped if it had been that time and so that's a consideration worth checking the tide times for when you're doing the Caradale to Campbelltown stretch which I hadn't considered but it's a really beautiful coastline absolutely stunning place so this is probably the most treacherous section at high tide black slippery rocks of death but it does it just looks beautiful stunning to look at so I'm going to put the camera away otherwise I'm going to end up coping it this is a really nice section very wild and rugged I would say so far that the, the coastal parts of the route are the trickiest, the hardest going, whether it's slippery rocks or sand and big pebbles to push through. But it's definitely more interesting. Oh Christ, that's me nearly over. I said I wasn't going to get the camera out, but yeah, I just thought this is so stunning. It has to be shared. A delightfully moody Scottish morning as well. Oh my God. I so very nearly just ended up on my arse. This boardwalk is lethal. There's some chicken wire here. It could use a little bit more, I think. Oh. To be fair though, the folks that um, maintain the trail seem to do an excellent job off it. The only um, things I've come across that have been a little bit treacherous are things like that boardwalk and then some of the Harry styles have been a bit slippy as well needing some chicken wire or something but yeah it's still amazing i'm sure it's probably volunteer led the efforts that they do another slippy harry there here's a good example of the notice boards with the tide times uh, but you can see there's quite a range of high tide times it really does depend on the time of year you're doing it and so i'd probably suggest checking that out before you start your trip there is an alternative route uh, that takes you up over the hill well over, like takes you up anyway and back down again but to be honest that is such a stunning bit of walk I'd advise planning your route so you can do it somebody's playing silly buggers here walked about seven and a half k and um, come down into this lowland uh, sort of farm area knees were really starting to kill it on the descent there and uh, I'm absolutely soaked everything is, is soaked through I'm either soaked on the inside or outside or both the rain started to come down real heavy on top of the hill um, so yeah I'm not going to stop for long I'm just going to push on uh, just straight through the farm here really find a road and then start climbing again so hopefully the moody Scottish weather backs off a bit and I'll get an opportunity to, to dry out a touch so we're not far from halfway really Probably about nine kilometers marks the halfway point between here and Lusseloch. So yeah, great progress. My bag is so much heavier now, or it feels much heavier, presumably because of all the water it's taken in from the heavy rain we had. And I guess that's one of the constraints of quite a heavy duty bag with thick fabric is it probably holds more moisture. Um, so yeah, really feeling it now but making good progress today anyway, so 
I can stop in the not too distant future. One thing I was going to mention was it's been quite sad to see a lot of fly tipping in Kintyre so far, you know, in, in loads of really quite remote and uh, beautiful scenic spots where the vegetation's like very diverse and very wild. It's just all this fly tipping. And for me in particular, it's, it, you know, it's sad because when I see that kind of habitat, it makes me weak at the knees because, you know, we just have so little of that richness in the borders. It's, it's great to see it, but then to see it ruined by fly tipping is just really quite sad. Um, I don't know what you do about that though, you know, we've got signs in, in the more obvious places saying, oh, you know, we'll fine you if you uh, continue to do this or, or if you try to do it. But in these really remote locations, you know, it would cost a fortune to put signs up and they would just fly tip somewhere else probably. It's a real shame, I mean, it seems like when they dismantled the fish farm, the folk working there just pushed a load of the rubble and tires and stuff off the, the edge to the coast thinking, oh, nobody's going to see this, but they pushed it right onto the entire way. <laughs> so it's quite obvious and a bit unsightly. Um, and then just some various other bits where I've stopped to go down at the river to get a drink of water. I've just been like, oh, look, fly tipping everywhere. Bits of netting, tires, waste metal, all sorts of stuff. Yeah, it's just, just a, a disregard for for the value of nature, I suppose, isn't it? Cash and time over environment, which is often the way things go. Perhaps, um, perhaps the entire way group, the people that manage the route and what have you, could could uh, could help in some way. Perhaps um, interpretation, or perhaps some signage or something like that, just to guilt trip people a bit into taking more care for the environment. Who knows? But anyway, enjoying this walk up from the farm. The weather has eased off a bit. Uh, straight up forestry road up to Lossa Loch. It's only about five miles from where I am just now, so should make it in good time. And I'm starting to dry off a little bit. I'm warm at least. A fire is going to be essential this evening, I think, just to dry some of the kit off and uh, warm the soul. We are roughly here at the minute. Come up from the farmy kind of area up to this point. So we still need to climb about 120, 40 meters. And then we'll descend about 100 meters again. And I'm thinking about camping here where there's benches and some broadleaf woodland. It's nice and flat. Hopefully get a good space to put up a lean to and have a fire just under the tarp. Um, and the rain's quite persistent. Some beautiful views. Um, and I'm, I'm still soaked and cooling down quite quickly. So my, I think my breaks will be short and often. About 8k to go, I think, 8.5k. It's not bad. Just had another soaking. Came over the hill and um, yeah, really, really misty conditions on top. I've walked about 15k since we left Caradale and another three to go before Lossa Loch and that's actually the end of the day so time wise it's 125 so absolutely smashing it today in terms of time um although I, I am feeling it big time um the usual complaints feet knees back <laughs> um potentially because i've got an absolute soaking pack proper uh, drenched at the minute uh, so a bit heavier than it has been uh, what am I trying to do with this thing get back to where I was yeah so yeah five hours 22 since we set off so yeah not much to say I'm considering having a bit of lunch here but the thing is if I stop for too long I just get really cold because I'm just so wet I kind of just want to have another snack, a break, just to get me to Lassa Loch, just so I can get the tarp up and get um, get a fire going, get dry. Because I'm going to need some time uh, to collect a lot of wood 
uh, so I only have to do one trip ideally uh, so yeah I'm spraffing now the view to my potential stop for the evening has appeared it does look good it looks sparse enough there's conifers I think I can see space under the trees at the at the coast so potentially a place that people have camped before uh, so yeah that's promising and I'm hoping that there's going to be a decent supply of wood fuel around oh. happy days It's alright, nice story that. Alright, got myself into that wood. It's not as ideal as I was expecting it. It's really wet underfoot. I'm going to have to put something down, I think. Uh, but the wind's also changed in a way because it seems to be predominantly coming down from the loch, uh, whereas it was coming from this way beforehand. Um, so I'm thinking ridge line from there to there, sleep in here fire there and uh, I'm just gonna crack on and get on with that now because it's already getting chilly okay tarp setup complete simple lean to um, I've pulled this middle connection up to there just because I felt the tarp was a bit low and that's actually opened up just a little bit of potential to hang things on to dry which is quite neat I plan to sleep down there. I'm going to have a fire over there, just outside of the tarp. Um, I'm a bit worried that that's a touch on the low side, because um, I want to have like a, a fairly decent sized fire. Um, but we'll see, and if we have to play around with it, we shall. Well, the rain's kind of passed, but it wouldn't be this trip without another conundrum. I went and sliced my finger open with my saw whilst I was preparing a platform to, to rest my um, bed on. And it was just, just silly. I really should have been watching what I was doing. I knew that I was going too fast. Slipped right into my finger. It's not, not, not really that bad a cut, but those saws, they really just, they slice in such a way where the blood just starts pouring out and one plaster wasn't enough, so I had to stick a big one on. It looks worse than it is. Uh, so yeah, just slow down. There's plenty of time. <laughs> Madness. So for the basis of the bed I've just sawn up some spruce and um, I'm now, I've now got some boughs over there and I'll get some bigger ones as well just to stick on top of that and take out some of the kind of sharper bits and some to stuff under that corner there uh, to raise it up a little bit as well. Now well you can see this but that's my spruce bow bed. It's not like a six inch um, design for insulation spec or or a proper spruce bow bed, I suppose, but it's just really to protect my my air mat from punctures. Um, it's Norway spruce, which I'm quite grateful is uh, it's Norway around here because it apparently makes the better bed. Um, Sick has quite jaggy, so oh, yeah, it, and it is taken from a live tree. Just in case anybody's wondering, you know why I'm hacking things off a live tree. And um, the size of these trees I'm taking these from, you know, I'm taking hardly anything at all, and so. It's um, it's a case of, you know, you call that responsible foraging. Yeah, I'm gonna get the light on, I think, because this is getting dark. There's the bed with the light on, just so you can see it. Right, I'm getting really quite peckish now, so get the air mat up. Uh, quick nibble first, actually, get the air mat up, and then we'll make a start on the fire. Update on the finger, it's, uh, it's not good. Well, after, an age of trying to get the fire started with various different methods, even throwing fire lighters at it, I've been beat. I just can't get it. Oh yeah, and I cut my thumb as well. <laughs> yeah, I just couldn't get it going. 
all the material including the ground is soaking wet here I'd put a bed of rocks down to try and lift it up off the ground and then split some hardwood um, to go on top of the rock so there was dryish material there but even the internal of the 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 hardwood was was wet it soaked right through and it's the same with um with all the the spruce that I'd got as well at like the various stages of of from tiny twigs up to bigger branches it's all just soaked totally through so even firelighters couldn't get it going um and really the only way to to get it would be to take down some dead standing that I've spotted and carve down into the the drier wood in the middle or sp split down into the drier wood and then carve feather sticks um, but to be honest with you I just can't be arsed with all that <laughs> I've done so much processing as it is I've spent so much time and energy on it um, I can't be bothered spending that so much more um, carving feather sticks so it's it's not really cold it's warm enough I'm, I've warmed up now with all the work and stuff so you know I'm all good uh, it's a shame because I, I really fancied a fire tonight and it would have helped me dry off my stuff and I've got the issue with uh, the gas as well I don't want to use too much gas um, and find myself in a sticky situation um, say there's no gas at Campbelltown but I've got some options around that I can um, either drink through my filter water and spit it back out into a cup I could do that um, or I could get bottled water from Campbelltown and carry water but to be honest like the thought of putting weight back in my bag again is just I just don't want to go there so yeah at least I've got a nice bed for the night and it's it's you know it's not freezing it's mildish winds kind of so so uh, so yeah just looking forward to getting back on the trail tomorrow really I'll, I'll read a bit of my book I'll do a bit of journaling uh, oh, and I'll make some dinner and hit the sack. I requested a weather report on the Garmin and it said high winds were, were due and right enough. That's exactly what's happened and I'm starting to feel quite sketchy about this location because um, it's a lot of conifers. It said it was broadleaves on the map, but it's, it's conifers mainly. And um, there's already blown ones in here. It's very wet. I don't suppose they're particularly deep rooted here so starting to feel a bit sketchy about it I do recall there was a barn a way back well not that far away but like back on the trail I'm gonna go check that out just now see what that's like because I might just set up my um, bivy bag and, and uh, sleeping bag and what have you in there and, and that'll be a safer option it does feel quite quite sketchy just now um, so yeah I'm gonna go check that out so I decided to make way for the barn after all. I came over and had a look and it just felt so much safer than the woods I was back in. Went back to the woods and yeah, it was really kicking off in there. So got my stuff packed down, brought it out along here. Finally somewhere I can just chill. So I've had some dinner um, and ready to, to do a bit of uh, note taking and journaling for the, for the walk. And yeah, just get an early night for an early rise tomorrow. Try and get away as, as sharp as I can check the weather in more detail and it's um, a mix of like 35 mile an hour winds at points as well as rain showers so not ideal conditions for the rest of the trip but I'm gonna have to see about getting some gas in Campbelltown I'm running really low now and um, yeah just uh, have a look at the map and see exactly where I'm planning on camping because if the winds are going to be as high as they're supposed to be Pitching um, in a woodland, unless it's a broadleaf woodland, is going to be probably too risky. So I'll have to have a think about that. So this barn's pretty neat. Not really much to it. Put the light on so you can see a bit more. I've even got a coat rack. Really hope the farmer doesn't mind me using this barn, but it's a case of safety in this instance. And um, yeah, I'm going to try and sneak out before anybody spots me. There's a harvester working on the hill uh, still, and um, I suspect they'll be back very early tomorrow to start again. So um, hopefully get out without creating too much of a fuss with them. So the, the only thing that's, that I can think about this place is that 
I guarantee there's going to be mice kicking about. So the um, the nails in the wood there, I'm going to hang up all my stuff tonight, keep it out of the way because the last thing I need is, is mice getting in and eating all my stuff or making holes and things. So um, yeah, bring on tomorrow.